Most of the laws governing veterinarians and laws governing companion animals or pets in the United States are passed and enforced at the state level. State legislatures, state veterinary medical boards, and state pharmacy boards. So we lobby for clients, and lobby is an old phrase talking about people that hung outside the bar at the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C. while President Grant got a drink. And then when he would come out into the lobby, they would rush him and say, hey, would you, could you support this? Could you support that? So it, it has a negative connotation for a lot of people. I'm happy to say I'm a lobbyist. I enjoy doing it. It just means you try to advocate in the governmental space. So if my client wants to stop something, prevent something bad from happening, or wants to pass and promote something good to happen, uh, I get hired to get that done. Um, and so it's, you know, I would say active, smart, strategic engagement with government officials in the states, and in some cases with the federal government. On the food animal side, regulation of cattle production, chicken production, pig production, and so forth, that's heavily regulated at the federal level. Uh, and I do some of that, but we're more involved in the lobbying on the, uh, at the state level. The other thing we do is we involve industry partners in our efforts for clients because it's rare that the issue affects only one company. So, you know, we're pretty skilled at pulling a team together, a coalition together. That's how I first met the industry as part of a coalition. And that's very much our style uh, in every case, if we can. More people, more brains, more resources. And, and politicians pay attention to numbers. There was a bill with a clever title called Fairness to Pet Owners that was proposed in Congress in 2010. And it was proposed by Walmart and some big box retailers to try to divert the pet prescriptions business away from small veterinary practices to online or to big box retailers. And that's fine, you know, America's a you know, free country and more power too if you can convince Congress to set up the rules so that happens. And uh, I was part of a small group that got wind of this in 2010. And we built a terrific coalition against a much better funded, big international competitor in the case of Walmart. And uh, there hasn't been a hearing on the bill since. It's 2019 now. So uh, very effective. It involved trade groups, nonprofits, the industry itself teaming up and, and it, was, uh, it was a surprising victory. I remember meeting with a lot of folks that summer and being told it's over. We, we don't beat Walmart. If, you, know, you know, they're you know, rock, paper, scissors. You know, they're, they're scissors and we're paper and uh, not so. Politicians count for a living. They count votes and they count supporters. And so I don't get two sentences out without reminding them that 65% of American households have a pet and they like their pet a lot. And by the way, virtually every politician has a pet and, then, and you don't go very far in the conversation without them showing you a photo on their iPhone or their cat or their dog and they're as proud as can be. And, and honestly, it's not a hard sell to get them to care. To get them to see the issue it takes some work. So what I talk about more than anything is a concept that's, that's used publicly and described publicly all the time called the human-animal bond, which is the evidence that pets aren't just fun, they're not just cute and entertaining, they actually improve people physically, their health, uh, there's you know, oxytocins are increased, cortisol is decreased, which are, are the good and bad sides of, of what can happen in your brain in terms of stress and, and uh, relaxation and so forth. So pets are good for you. and. There's a social value to pets. Pets take strangers that would never have met, never have talked, and they'll spend 20 minutes together in a park. They don't talk about money, they don't talk about you know, where they live, they talk about their dog and what their names are, what they like to do. And suddenly, you're connected in a community and you feel safer, you're a bit more engaged. A lot of data now showing that that leads to a stronger sense of community. So my basic message is, Pets are good for people and good for communities. So policies that promote pet access, encourage pet ownership, uh, support veterinarians and their ability to, to uh, provide health care, you know, are good broadly. It's good public policy. And, and I go one step further and make the argument that the federal government puts on, on a certain level stopping smoking, good nutrition, daily exercise, eat your vegetables, 
and they should put pet ownership at the same level. It should be viewed as a, as a national policy, not to require everybody to have a pet, but to promote it and to recognize and to remove barriers to that. And that's, I spend a lot of time, uh, more all the time, promoting that, you know, pushing that issue, that it's, it's more than just pets are fun.